My name is Jessica Travis. I'm the project manager for Craft Healthcare. And we appreciate everyone logging in this morning to participate in the webinar that we've put together on telehealth. Um, when I say we, I mean Stacey Sternberg. She's a part of our coding and compliance team here at Craft. Um, as you can see on the title slide, she has an alphabet after her name. Um, she has so many certifications and qualifications um, to direct us through this time right now. I'm sure everyone um, has a story or a bit of information about how the COVID-19 um, pandemic has been affecting them both personally and with their business. And because of that, telehealth has become um, our new normal in how we deal with clients and patients and um, everything in between. So um, we thought it would be fitting to have a presentation about this to kind of help guide you guys through um, what's happening right now and to help you. Um, so in just a minute, Stacey's gonna start um, the presentation. We have everyone muted just because there's so many um, people and we can't have everyone talking at once. But if you look, um, in the little window on the right hand side of your screen at the bottom, there's a chat box. If you have any questions, please type them there. Um, once we get to the end of the presentation, if we have some time for questions and answers, we will get to that. Um, Stacy's email is going to be given to you guys at the end of the presentation. If you have questions um, after this, you can email her directly um, with questions. Um, but like I said, for now, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and Stacy, if you're ready, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you so we can get started. Thanks, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. I know you guys are really busy, so we do appreciate you taking time out of your day to be a part of this. Um, I'm gonna do just a little quick housekeeping. Um, please read the disclaimer. Because as you all know, the regs are changing very quickly. The information is, is in an influx and CMS is, recognizes that both non-COVID-19 and COVID-19 patients need to be treated in a safe environment. So they're trying to adapt quickly. And so the, the regs are changing very quickly. So I would tell you to use this as an educational guide, but Again, be aware that it's changing very quickly. Feel free to email me and ask me any questions um, or for clarification or check with your local Mac. The first part of the presentation is gonna be sort of telehealth basics. Prior to the pandemic or the public health crisis that we're facing now, telehealth, there were some certain basics. So I'm going to go through those fairly quickly because we have a lot of information to cover today. So I'll move through these and then we'll talk about what our new normal is and what it's going to be. These next few slides, again, are just meant to give you a foundation. First of all, is there a difference between telehealth and telemedicine? The fact sheets from CMS state, telehealth, telemedicine, and related terms generally refer to the exchange of medical information from one site to another through electronic communication to improve telehealth services. They also list three main types on their fact sheets. They go Medicare telehealth visits, virtual check-ins, and e-visits. When you talk to people, typically they'll tell you telehealth is providing care with audiovisual technology between a physician and a patient. And they'll tell you telemedicine is the concept of providing care with technology. However, if you'll notice in the latest communications and things coming out from CMS, they're, they're using these terms interchangeably. And that's creating a little bit of confusion because we don't know if they're referring to E&M visits or all type visits, which typically are not telehealth visits. So we have to be really careful. The World Health Organization, uh, their website, they use the terms uh, interchangeably. If you look at some of the things that on their websites and articles that have been put out, they've been quoted as saying some distinguish telemedicine from telehealth 
with the former restricted to service delivery by physicians only and the latter signifying services provided by health professionals in general, including nurses, pharmacists, and others. So again, the reason I put this in here is I want people to realize that these terms are used interchangeably at times. And if there is any confusion or any just clarification needed, contact your MAC and, and ask those questions. Telemedicine basics. Th this slide will show you the type of telemedicine and give you some examples. So we've got live video conferencing, store and forward, remote patient monitoring, and mobile health shown on this slide. Live video conferencing, that synchronous services happening at the same time between the physician and the patient. And you'll hear that term synchronous over and over. Um, it will be used in a lot of publications, webinars, but that's really important. Synchronous is just real time. Yet live video conferencing provides timely care, especially in emergencies or urgent situations. It also maintains the doctor-patient relationship by having face-to-face -face analysis and treatment. They're able to see each other and engage in conversation because, again, it is audio and video. Store and forward, that's not asynchronous. Uh, that's not synchronous. It's asynchronous. It doesn't have to happen at the same time. That's, you know, you send x-rays, MRIs, uh, pictures of the condition to a specialist and for them to review and give you feedback and say, okay, you know, give me your opinion. What is this? And then we have mobile health. Mobile health refers to the practice of medicine and public health supported by a mobile device such as mobile phones, tablets. Patients are able to track their own health data in real time. And then we have also, I, I skipped over it, but it's re, re, remote patient monitoring. That's your Holter monitors, your checking pulse ox, anything that's connected to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled wearables that report patient activity. And then Medicare telehealth visits. This is a visit with a provider that uses telecommunication services between a provider and a patient. Um, I've listed the CPT codes here. And typically, this is for established patients only. In a normal environment when there's no pandemic or per public health emergency, these are for established patients only. But we're gonna talk in a minute, a waiver was passed and that's been broadened. Those restrictions have been waived in some of the, in light of the public health crisis. And again, here's a couple more virtual check-ins and e-visits. And we're gonna go into detail about what these are. But if you look at the far right, you'll see Again, it's that established patients only. But CMS has now loosened the reins and said, okay, we're going to waive some of these restrictions. And you're going to hear me say some of the same information more than once during this webinar, but it will be applicable to a specific CPT code. And it's because when you look at this information, it's important that you remember some of these changes are temporary and only valid during the public health crisis. Place of service code, typically in pre-pandemic, pre-public health emergency, telehealth was always a zero two. Place of service code on your claims. Now, during the public health crisis, that's not always the case. When you're dealing with public health, uh, when you're dealing with telehealth, it's important that you remember that there's always an originating site and a distant site. The originating site is where the member or the patient is located at at the time healthcare services are delivered to the patient by means of health telehealth. 
The distant site is where the provider's at, and that must be within the U.S. or U.S. territories. Here's a list of distant site providers. It includes physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, midwives, CRNAs, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers. And there, if you'll notice, for clinical psychologists and clinical social workers, typically there's a list of codes that they can't bill for. But again, some of that stuff has been waived during the, cur the current crisis. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. What's our new normal? What's it going to look like? We know what it looks like today, but we don't know what it's going to look like in two weeks or a month or even after this public health crisis is over. But let's talk about what it looks like today. On March 6th, the House and Senate passed and the President signed the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act. You'll see in my slide, I reduced that down to CPRSA because that's a mouthful. But the key points and the takeaways from this are that for effective March 6, dates of service March 6, 2020, and for the duration of the COVID-19 public health emergency, Medicare will make payment for Medicare telehealth services furnished to patients in broader circumstances. The visits are considered the same as in-person in visits and are paid at the same rate as in-person visits. Medicare will make payment for professional services furnished to beneficiaries in all areas of the country and in all settings, which was not always the case. While they must, <clears throat> While they must generally travel or be located in certain types of originating sites, such as a physician's office, a SNF, or a hospital for the visit during this public health emergency, Medicare will make payment for telehealth services furnished to their beneficiaries in any health care facility and in their home. And again, that was not the case prior to this public health emergency. The Medicare coinsurance and deductible would generally apply to these services. However, the OIG is providing flexibility for healthcare providers to reduce or waive the cost sharing for telehealth visits paid by federal healthcare programs. The Medicare 1135 waiver. This is this is part of the changes that the initial changes that took place on March 6th. We're going to talk about these, but then again, on March 30th, they um, broadened what they were doing and even uh, removed some more and restrictions and waived restrictions so that telehealth can be provided in a broader scale. As of March 6th, the visual component is still needed, meaning you've got to have both audio and visual. I mean, audio and video for telehealth services. Individual states, though, AMA says, and some of the CMS guidance says, individual states through executive order or payers may permit the use of E&M codes with audio only encounters. And again, this is something that, and we're going to go through this in a lot more detail, but when you have audio only, and e &M, that is something I'd certainly verify with my payer if it was covered, as well as my local MAC, because that does have to be through an executive order. I do know that MGMA is advocating for audio only in certain circumstances because of the fact some older adults struggle with the video component of telehealth, and there's rural areas where internet's spotty and it's really hard to get the video portion of this. The changes that took effect March 6 were the designated rural area and originating site restrictions have been lifted. This allows qualified healthcare professionals to build telehealth encounters for any patient location. Again, that includes their home. During this public health emergency, a waiver is in place that eliminates the need to be an established patient. That's a big deal because we now have codes that physicians can utilize for new patients. 
Also, certain smartphones can be used by the provider and patients for telehealth purposes. However, both phones must, again, at this time, must have audio and video capabilities so that it's a real two-way or synchronous encounter. Practices can reduce or waive patient co-pays or for telehealth visits. Telehealth allowed diagnosis. During this public health emergency, there's been a little bit of confusion of, well, can I provide, are the benefits or the services different for COVID-19 patients versus no non-COVID-19 patients? Telehealth provisions allow care without regard to the diagnosis of the patient to prevent vulnerable beneficiaries from unnecessarily entering a healthcare facility when needs can be met remotely. They gave, they cited an example saying the patient needed a visit with a physician for the refill of a medication. The services must still be reasonable and necessary, but they don't have to be specifically relate, related to COVID-19. HIPAA, effective immediately, the Office of Civil Rights will exercise enforcement discretion and waive penalties for HIPAA violations against healthcare providers that serve patients in good faith there's the key phrase, in good faith, through everyday communication technologies. You can use things like FaceTime, Google Hangout, Zoom for Healthcare, Doxy.me, Skype. The OCR advises that providers should not use tech technologies that are public facing, such as Facebook Live, Twitch, or TikTok. Can't imagine a provider using Facebook Live or TikTok. I'm not real familiar with TikTok, but doesn't seem like the appropriate place. At any rate, the OCR announced that it will use its enforcement discretion for physicians using telehealth so that if they do not have time to conduct a security risk analysis or enter a BAA, they can still use telehealth to see patients during the crisis without fear of HIPAA penalties. But again, in good faith, you know, make sure you're taking steps and and reasonable things are put in place. You know, do as much as you can. We're gonna start talking about the next set of changes which were done on March 30th. CMS announced plans to temporarily relax a number of key regulations and backdate the implement implementation to March 1st. The move, which includes other measures to relieve administrative burden and reinforce clinical clinician staffing positions, positions to respond quicker to the current public health emergency. So again, all these steps are being taken place in hopes that physicians can respond, facilities can respond a lot quicker to the needs of their patients. Additional hospital services, home visits, have been added to the list of CMS services that you can provide pediatric critical care, intensive care, inpatient neonatal codes. All those can now be provided via telehealth. Temporary additions for ad additional services that can be performed via telehealth include care planning for patients with cognitive impairment, psychological and neuropsychological testing, physical therapy, occupational therapy. And again, you'll see where I've got this highlighted on here. Um, initially, this was changed on March 6th, but they reiterated it again on March 30th that services can be provided to new or established patients. Subsequent inpatient telehealth may be performed daily without the prior limit of once every three days they um, removed some of those frequency limitations on several codes, and we're gonna talk about those in some slides to come, but those, that's pretty big. Two of the most, I shouldn't say most common, but two of the, the sections that are being used are telehealth services that are being used a lot are virtual check-ins and e-visits. Um, the HCPCS codes G2010 and G2012, uh, typically, again, they're estab were established patients. Now you can do uh, new and established. 
licensed clinical social workers, clinical psychologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech, speech and language pathologists. They can provide e-visits utilizing those G2061 through 2063 codes. Um, a broad range of clinicians, including physicians, can now provide certain services by telephone. And we're going to, we have a whole section of slides to talk about those, but telephone services were previously not covered. So let's talk about virtual check-ins first. The two main categories of virtual check-ins are face-to-face -face video visits or non-face-to-face e-visits and other digital communication. These are considered non-telehealth visits and don't require real-time audio and video interaction. Let's talk about those first two codes. PickPick G2010. That's considered a store and forward code. Provider evaluation of a patient generated picture or video image is sent to the provider by the patient. Follow up is required. It includes the subsequent communication by the providers in response to the information that is sent by the patient. If the image, now this is important, if the images is insufficient to make a determination, you can't bill. If the remote evaluation of the image takes place during an inpatient visit, takes place within seven days after an inpatient visit, or in-person visit, I should say, or triggers an in-person visit within 24 hours, or the soonest, to pay, soonest available appointment, the evaluation is not billable, and payment is considered to be bill, to be bundled into the relevant in-office E&M code. So, G2010. Let's say I was out working in my yard, and I now have this rash. Well, I send a picture of it to my physician and say, "Okay, this is poison oak, poison ivy," and they review it and they respond and say it's poison ivy, put cream on it. Okay, they can build that code. But if they look at it and they say, okay, I'm not sure what that is, I need to see you, then that service is included in that in-person visit that they're going to see me and they can't build this code. G2012. That is a telephone conversation that includes five to 10 minutes of medical discussion. Verbal consent needs to be noted in the record for each instance use of this code. No frequency limitations at this time. Copays do apply. It can't be done by staff. It has to be done by the billing provider. And the, this code is not considered, neither of these codes are considered telehealth codes because while G2010 includes a picture or video, there's no audio typically. It can be a message sent back. Uh, G2012, there's no video. It's telephone. Real-time audio-visual equipment is not required for G2010 or G2012, and that's why they're not considered um, telehealth services. And you don't use the place of service 02. Typically, you use the place of service 11 for these codes. Again, this was traditionally for established patients only, but during the public health crisis, it is new and established patients. It must be patient initiated. The physician or provider may respond to the patient's concern by telephone, audio, video, secure text messaging, email, or electronic health record portal, but it has to be patient initiated. Physician must document patient verbal consent because the patient is going to get a bill. Copays apply. So you need their consent to say, look, I'm charging you for this phone call or I'm going to charge you to review this video or picture you sent. Virtual check-ins can be delivered only by those practitioners authorized to furnish E&M services. 
Only physicians and qualified healthcare professionals are allowed to bill for this service. G2012 is a time-based code that said five or, 10 medical, five or 10 minutes medical discussion that has to be documented in the note. Again, not separately billable if it's related to an ENN service. Um, virtual check-ins can be used for the treatment of COVID-19 from anywhere, including places of residence like homes, nursing homes, assisted living um, facilities. No frequency limitations. We talked about copays. Make sure you've got that consent. Make sure it's documented. Documentation, especially during this public health crisis, is your friend. E-visit codes. Qualified healthcare providers who can bill for E&M codes within the scope of service should utilize the following codes. These are typically through an online patient portal. It's cumulative time for seven days, five to 10 minutes, 11 to 20 minutes, 21 minutes or more. Um, here's the codes for speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational, clinical psychologists. There's codes for them as well. The, the things to remember about this is these services can only be reported when the billing practice has an established relationship with the patient, typically. This is not limited to only rural settings. There are no geographic or location restrictions for these services. Patients communicate with their doctors without going to the doctor's office by using those patient portals. Again, this is patient initiated. The Medicare coinsurance and deductible generally apply to these services. Make sure you have that consent. The established patient right now has been waived. Again, we talked about this cumulative time, spent over seven days, document the time spent in the note. Uh, it can't be related to an evaluation and management service within the previous seven days or if it results in a face-to-face E&M within the next seven days. I cannot stress enough documentation, documentation, documentation. I'm not saying you've got to write a book, but make sure that it's clear. Your documentation is clear. Telehealth E&M visits. They do require the interactive audio and video telecommunications, real-time synchronous communication. Medicare did, this is unusual. Uh, Medicare requires a place of service code that would have been used if the service had been conducted in person and modifier 95. Typically, Medicare didn't use modifier 95. That was for commercial payers only. But now they're telling you to use modifier 95 during this public health um, emergency. During this, also during the COVID-19 crisis, CMS is not requiring a history or exam to be used in selecting an E&M service via telehealth. A clinician may use the current documentation guidelines of medical decision-making alone to select the code, or they can use total time on the day of service. Again, that is not staff time. Typically, when you use time, counseling sort of dominates the visit, in this case, it doesn't have to during this crisis. The clinician can include non-face-to-face -face time, such as reviewing records or looking at images. But your documentation needs to say, I, if you're gonna do time, I spent X amount of time with the patient. We talked about this. I reviewed records and I looked at the following images. Right now, incident two billing, not at all. For telehealth. It might change later, but you cannot do infinite to via telehealth right now. Um, they're paid, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, paid at the same rate as regular inpatient, in-person visits. I don't know why I keep saying inpatient, but it's in-person. Patients must be made aware of potential cost sharing and their consent to receive these services. Um, we just talked about the fact that you can do it on MDM or time. Again, 
it has to be medically necessary, and the MDM should be documented. Here's a chart that shows just basically by um, section or service, office or outpatient visits, telehealth con for ER, uh, SNF, hospital, nursing care facility. It just gives you that section of codes or category of codes to use. I'm going to walk through this and hopefully this will make sense and help you decide what code you use and what type of visit it is. If you ask yourself, first of all, is there a video or picture involved? If it's yes, then is it real time? If the answer is still yes, then it's telehealth. You're going to use the ENM codes for established or new patients. If it is Yes, there's a video or picture, but no, it's not in real time. That's a virtual check-in, and you use that G2010. If there's no picture or video, and the communication is determined if an E&M is necessary. So this is, you're, you're calling the patient, that's a yes, and virtual check-in um, G2012. If no video or no picture, is the patient on the phone? If no, you're going to use an e-visit code. You're probably talking through them through a portal. If yes, you're going to use these. And we're going to go through these codes in just a minute, the 99441 through 99443. Removal of frequency limitations on Medicare telehealth. This is big for um, skilled nursing and facilities because a subsequent inpatient visit can be furnished via Medicare telehealth without limitation that the telehealth visit is once every three days. There's the listing of codes. Same for a skilled nursing, um, that without limitation that the telehealth visit is once every 30 days, and then critical care consults may be furnished to a Medicare beneficiary by telehealth beyond the once per day limitation. So again, they've removed those frequency limitations. Telephone service. They This says effective March 30th. That's when the change came in, but they backdated um, these changes with an effective date of service of March 1st. CMS will start paying for telephone calls utilizing the following CPT codes. This is big because all of these were non-covered. Prior to this public health crisis, all of these had a non-covered status. Physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, they should use the 99441 through 99443. Other qualified health professionals such as dietitians, social workers, speech language, physical and occupational therapists, they should use 98966 through 98968. Again, these are not telehealth services because they don't have audio and video, so you don't use that O2. And right now, you're not. There's very few cases where you would use that place of service O2 anyway. Telephone E and M service by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional. Again, new and established during the public health emergency. The discussion must be initiated by the patient parent or guardian. You need to document the reason for the communication, the pertinent data reviewed, the assessment, and the plan. It's not separately billable if it's related to an E&M service within the past seven days or it leads to an E&M service within the next 24 hours or the soonest appointment available. Here's the breakdown of those telephone codes. If you notice, again, they're time-based codes, 5 to 10 minutes, 11 to 20 minutes, 21 to 30 minutes. So it is important. You've got to document in the record how much time you spent discussing things with the patient. These are the codes for other qualified health um, professionals, you know, the dietitians, the speech language, OT, it's the 966, 967, and 968, same time increments, and again, time has to be documented. 
remote patient monitoring. This is your pulse ox, your Holter monitors, things like that. Um, clinicians can provide remote patient monitor services to both new and established. These are services can provide, be provided for both acute and chronic conditions and can now be provided for patients with only one disease. And here's your codes and the descriptions. Any of these, I, I put this in here because some have time based and some aren't. So anytime, that's one of the biggest things we can see as an auditor is sometimes um, providers or other health professionals will use a time-based code, but it, we can't find the supporting documentation that shows the amount of time spent. So read your description of the code, make sure that it's included in the documentation. Um, 99493, 99494, those are both psychiatric collaborative care management codes. Um, the description, you know, go through and make sure that you, you're following everything and you have all the documentation to support that code or any code, not just these. Other telehealth, Medicare telehealth and remote patient care. This is for ESRD patients. Um, there's a lot of regs typically that, that go with ESRD patients that says, you, you know, you have to have a hands-on visit per month and things like that. But now for Medicare patients with ESRD, clinicians no longer have no longer must have one hands-on visit per month for the current required clinical examination of the vascular access site. CMS is also exercising enforcement discretion on the following requirements so that clinicians can provide the service via telehealth. Individuals must receive a face-to-face -face visit without the use of telehealth at least monthly in the case of the, the initial three months of home dialysis and at least once every three consecutive months after the initial three month visit. So they're, they're, they're given some latitude and some room for those ESRD um, dialysis patients. To the extent that NCDs or LCDs would otherwise require a face-to-face -face evaluation and assessments, clinicians would not have to meet those requirements during the public health crisis. Uh, nursing home residents. CMS is waiving the requirement for physicians and non-physician practitioners to perform in-person visits for nursing home residents and allow visits to be conducted as appropriate via telehealth options. The next few slides are gonna show you um, an, the additional, CMS added an additional 80 codes that can be during this uh, telehealth crisis, I mean, public health crisis that can be uh, provided via telehealth. But it's important to remember, in order to bill for any of these services mentioned that I'm about to show you, you must have that synchronous, interactive, real-time audio-visual with the patient. You've got emergency department visits, initial and subsequent observation and observation discharge day management, initial hospital care and hospital discharge day management, initial nursing facility, visits all levels and nursing facility discharge day, critical care services, rest home, domiciliary, custodial care service, those are new and established patients, home visits, new and established patients, all the levels, inpatient neonatal, pediatric critical care, initial and subsequent. Initial and continuing intensive care services, care planning for patients with cognitive impairment, psychological and neuropsychological testing, therapy services, physical and occupational therapy, all levels, radiation treatment management services. Um, the, there's the link for all of the 
telehealth service codes that CMS is allowing us to use temporarily, licensed clinical social workers, clinical psychology, psychologist services, physical therapy services, OT, speech, language, they all can now be paid for via Medicare telehealth. Licensed, a, a, a practitioner providing services via telehealth must be licensed in the state in which the patient is located. CMS has temporarily waived the requirement that physicians or other healthcare professionals hold license in the state in which they provide services if the four conditions are met. And again, these four are for Medicare. You can check with um, other payers and see if they're following suit. I've also attached in one of our handouts, it gives you, it lists um, some of the, the licensure waiver information. But the four conditions that need to be met is they must be enrolled in Medicare, must possess a valid license to practice in the state that relates to his or her Medicare enrollment, is furnishing services, whether in person or via telehealth, in a state in which the emergency is, occur is occurring in order to contribute to re the relief efforts in his or her professional capacity and is not affirmatively excluded from practice in the state or any other state that is a part of the emergency area. The waiver does not have the effect of waiving state or local licensure requirements or any requirements specified by state or local governments. Those requirements would continue to apply unless waived by the state. Electronic prescription. If prescribing practitioner has previously conducted an in-person medical evaluation of the payment, patient, they can issue a prescription for a controlled substance after having communicated with the patient via telemedicine or any other means. And then you'd see the note down there about um, it's got to be for a legitimate medical purpose and it's got the practitioner is acting in the usual course of his or her professional practice. Billing for telehealth. We've talked a little bit um, throughout this presentation about place of service and typically O2 would be what you would use under normal, normal circumstances. But during the public health crisis, CMS is telling you to bill with the place of service equal to what it would have been in the absence of the public health emergency along with modifier 95, indicating that the services rendered was actually performed via telehealth. CMS has a modifier CR that means crisis related, but for whatever reason, they're not asking us to use that during this COVID-19 crisis. For example, a physician practicing in an office setting who sees patients via telehealth instead of in person would report place of service 11 and append modifier 95 to the claim lines. So, that the described services, it, it lets them know that this was done via telehealth. During the COVID public health emergency, CMS recognizes that physician practices are moving a significant portion of their services from in-person visits to telehealth visits, but they're still incurring the same resource costs as if they were, in, they were furnishing them in person. So, for that reason, CMS is paying providers the same rate as they would if it was an in-person visit. Again, um, consistent with rules for traditional telehealth services, there are two scenarios where modifiers are required uh, for Medi Medicare telehealth claims, and that's your GQ and GO. I'll show you those on the next screen that lets you know here we go. The GO is telehealth services furnishes, furnished for purposes of diagnosis, evaluation, or treatment of symptoms of an acute stroke. And it gives you the information there. GQ, telehealth services rendered via asynchronous telecommunication system. And the 95 is synchronous tele telemedicine services. 
So again, it is it real time? If it is 95, if it is not real time, it's GQ. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the ICD-10 coding that goes along during this crisis period. These codes were put in by the CDC February 20th, 2019. The sequences are listed. You're going to first always list the cause and second list the condition. So for patients with pneumonia, case confirmed. It's confirmed that it's a result of the COVID-19, you're going to code first the J1289, other viral pneumonia, and you're going to code second the B9729, other coronavirus as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere. Acute bronchitis, the J20.8, and the B9729. Bronchitis not otherwise specified, J40, B9729. Respiratory infections. Patients with COVID-19 documented as being associated with a lower respiratory infection, NOS, or acute respiratory infection, NOS, is going to be that J22 and B9729. Patients with COVID-19 documented as being associated with a respiratory infection, NOS, should assign J98.8 and B97.29. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. ARDS may develop with COVID-19. Patients with ARDS due to COVID-19 should assign J80 and B9729. According to the interim clinical guidelines for management of patients with confirmed 2019 COVID-19 infections, and there's the, the link on the CDC that gives that clinical guidance. Exposure to COVID-19. Patients where there is a concern about possible exposure, but it's ruled out after evaluation, there is should use Z03.818. But patients where there is actual exposure should use Z20.828. Again, it's concerned about, but then it's ruled out, but then there's a different code for actual exposure to. Signs and symptoms. Patients presenting with signs and symptoms and where a definitive diagnosis has not been established should assign codes for the signs and symptoms. You know, it's important to note that B34.2 coronavirus infection unspecified would, in general, not be appropriate for COVID-19 cases or respiratory in nature. So if you've got signs and symptoms, but you don't have a definitive diagnosis, you're going to code cough, shortness of breath, fever. If the provider documents suspected, possible, or probable, do not assign the B9729. Assign a code explaining the reason for the encounter. And then you can also, uh, the reason for the encounter could be contact with and suspected exposure to. Effective April 1st, a U code was put into place. U07, conditions of certain etiology. We're going to see this on the next screen, but it is U07.1. And the CDC assigned a U code because they, they can add codes in this section twice a year. Um, the, the suspicion is this code is eventually going to be moved to section B, but they can only do that they can add codes in the U section for emergencies, but you can't add into like section B except twice a year. So again, here's your U07.1, COVID-19, there's your excludes notes. It excludes B34.2, B97.29 to, uh, and then it also excludes J12.81. And they expect more information to come out on this. 
So that now that we've gone through all this, before I go into this section, I'm going to pull up very quickly. The AMA has come out with some scenarios that sort of walk through how you should code. Uh oh. All right, give me one second. Sorry, I'm having. Can you see my screen? Yeah, Let's Stacey, see. we can, can see the scenario three at the top. Okay, good. Sorry, I was a little technically challenged. This is AMA <laughs> slides. They updated this on um, April 3rd, and I thought because it's directly related to telehealth that we'd look at some of these. Um, the first scenario, the scenario three, the patient received a telehealth visit um, for COVID-19 is directed to go to their physician's office or physician group practice setting for testing. So it's like, here's the questions you're going to ask. Who's performing? Here's the physician or qualified health professional. Is it a new patient? Is it established? Patient goes to the site. They do throat swabs. Here's the lab test. So it basically gives you a walkthrough and tells you, it says, okay, here is what you're going to do, and here's how you're going to code it. There are some really good scenarios on here. And again, this is uh, put out by AMA, but it, it really walks you through what to do. The next one is a patient received telehealth visit for COVID-19 and is directed to an unaffiliated testing site. So, okay, here's, you know, you come in, they come in, you, the patient, the physician sees them, they do a swab, and it goes, through, there's your place of service, it gives you the notes, it gives you the codes, and it walks you through that whole process. Scenario seven, physician orders remote physiological monitoring following patient quarantined at home after receiving a COVID-19 diagnosis. It's saying who's performing it. Here's your applicable CPT codes, 99453 plus 99457 or Again, it's walking, it gives you all of this information. And this is, the reason I bring this up is I wanted you to, to be very sure to utilize this handout because telehealth can be really confusing and it can be convoluted if you don't know which codes to choose. So all of these handouts and these scenarios by the AMA they walk you through, they guide you through all of these visits, be it whether they, you do part of it, telehealth, they come in the office, um, here's virtual check-ins, online patient portal information, telehealth, telephone visits, and this one is COVID or non-COVID case. So it walks you through a variety of what needs to be done and and how to do it so what now what do we do now that we have all of this information and it's changing and how do you handle that well the first thing you're going to do is you're going to assemble a team Assemble a telehealth implement, implementation team that can make decisions and do research quickly in an effort to launch as soon as possible. And, you know, here's some questions. What do my patients need? Does my existing EHR vendor have a telehealth function that can be turned on? What's the best remote option? What type of equipment? What is my practice or facility? What's the best option for my practice or facility? Uh, does my provider's malpractice insurance cover telehealth or telemedicine? You know, what are the current telehealth coverage and payment guidelines? These are going to be different based on patient's insurance plan. 
And there is an organization, I don't think I put this on the resource page, and I meant to, but there's an organization, American Health Insurance Plans. The website is ahip.org. And on that website, you can see, you can look up by insurance carrier to see what they're doing and how they're responding to the COVID crisis. In the resources section, there's the fact sheet, there's press releases, frequently asked questions, the telehealth codes, um, there's the AMA quick guide to telemedicine, the telepsychiatry and COVID. Uh, oh, it is on there, the American um, health insurance plans. And I guess at this time we'll open it up for questions and we'll do as many of those as time permits. All right, Stacey, we had a few questions in the chat box. Um, one of them was, can e-visits be billed by hospitals where physical therapists typically build therapy on UBs, although paid under the physician fee schedule? Jessica, I would email me that one. I, I want to say Yes, but I'd like, before I give that answer, let me do some research and make sure. Um, I do know that those can be billed on the HICFA. Okay. Yeah, I have the names of people who um, put questions in the chat box, and I'll send those to you after this, and that way you can get back to everyone. So, um, everyone, if you typed a question into the chat box, don't worry, we will be getting responses to you. Um, another question was, for virtual check-in G2012, do you document the actual length of the call separately from the chart review or is time, or time is inclusive of all? Is that the same rule for telehealth visits such as doxy.me? For G2012, I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback. For G2012, you're going to document that in the, the note because G2012 is five or ten minutes of medical discussion. So, and that does include reviewing records or reviewing images. But again, the documentation, the, the progress note or the office note, the visit note, I should say, should include that I spent ten minutes um, speaking to the patient about this. I reviewed records and, um, or I looked at images, just say what you did, the, the data elements that were relevant data, data elements that were, were reviewed and the time spent. And again, that G2012 is um, real time. And these are patient initiated and they include the response. Okay, another question that's in the chat box is what documentation or consents are required for televisits? Um, it, televisits is sort of a broad term. Can they be more specific? Are they, is that referencing e-visits through the patient portal or is it virtual check-ins? Mm, I will wait and see if she um, gives or any more Or just send me your email. Yeah, send me, uh, we can, I can address that one via email because televisits, Again, that, that comes from using those terms interchangeably. CMS, oh, so the World she Health Organization. She just said neither. She's referring to ENM. Okay, what was the question again then? What documentation or consents are required for televisits? Uh, same consent. Um, you need to, for, I can send a, um, send her an email, but basically for E&M, you're going to need to document 
if you're billing by MDM, medical decision making, you're going to have to document, have documentation that supports that, you know, the chronic conditions. Why did it, why was it a low complexity versus uh, a moderate? Um, if you're billing for time, you're going to say, you know, I looked at records, I uh, ordered labs, uh, well, in a public health emergency, that's going to be difficult, but you're going to say, I reviewed records, I looked at old information, I counsel, I talked to the patient about these conditions. The documentation is pretty much the same, except you're going to, in that, say, in that documentation, you're going to give an example of, you know, the patient acknowledged, consented, and is aware of that this is being this visit's being conducted via telehealth, um, they consented, and that kind of thing. But again, if that one, I can provide a lot of additional information if, if they'd like an email on it. Okay, perfect. Um, another question here is, what would you suggest in terms of documentation for MDs using freestanding audio video like Zoom or FaceTime, since telehealth services will not interface with EHR? How does the MD document the visit took place? I think some MDs are under the impression that the video is enough, even if they're not storing or saving the video. A lot of that is being the documentation. Again, they need to, the patient, first of all, patient consent that says, okay, the patient has acknowledged that this is being provided via telehealth utilizing this this technology and as far as the storage since it's not integrated um i again i would my documentation would reflect that you know i spoke to patient about this the data elements or the the things we discussed were x it was this long of a conversation. Patient was aware, they acknowledged, they consented. You know, let that, you don't, you don't have to write a book, but that documentation that should say that the patient is well aware that this was, this is the telehealth visit conducted via doxy.me. We talked about their blood pressure for 10 minutes. We talked about the medications that they're on, the possibility of changing medications. Um, and they consented and knew that this, you know, they were going to be billed. Okay. What if the physician is performing the telehealth visit from their home and not their office? Does that change the site of service box on the claim form? If that physician typically bill, it's my understanding, if that physician typically uses a place of service 11, again, if you go back to slide, let's see if I can find it very quickly. CMS's guidelines say to use the place of service that they would typically use under normal circumstances. And it's on slide, I'm looking for it right now. Um, it's on in the 40s, sorry, it's taking me so long. Here we go. Uh, it's on slide 48. It says that um, during this public health emergency that you're going to use the place of service that that you would typically that the physician would typically use under normal circumstances okay she's saying not the place of service facility address, the info that goes into box 32. Oh, gotcha. Um, I think I, I, there was a lot of discussion about that on the frequently asked questions. And it's my understanding and have, um, that's one I will send an email to, but it's my understanding that in that box 32, you're gonna put that office address, but you're gonna, that modifier 95, that's what's gonna let them know that, 
this is being done telehealth versus that normal inpatient or uh, in person. I've got to stop saying inpatient. In person visit like it normally would. But I will send her a link on that because there's a lot of discussion about that. Okay, and one more. Um, can all levels be billed the same like in P and PA? Say that again. Can all levels? Can all levels be billed the same like NPs and PAs? Are they all billed the same? All levels of ENM service co uh, CPT codes. For nurse practitioners and physician assistants, uh, they would. There's no incident to right now, so they can bill like they normally would, but they have to bill using their NPI with the with the place of service and the modifiers. All right. I think that's all of the questions right now that were in the chat box. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Like we said at the beginning, if you have any additional questions, please email them to Stacy. Um, her email is up on the screen right now, Stacy at crafthealthcare.com. Also, a lot of you guys are asking about the materials. Um, if you click on the materials tab above the chat box, um, there's a lot of supplemental information as well as um, a PDF of the PowerPoint for you. Um, so if no one has any further questions, I want to thank everyone for logging in and participating with us. Um, I hope you are all staying safe and sane. And like we said, if you have any additional questions, please email them to Stacy. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, guys.